Welcome back, y'all. We're in lesson 17, building general linear systems problems. In the last videos, we saw how to build a cubic interpolation problem from a descent path on an airplane. In this video, we're gonna do something that I've been curious about for a long time, which is to build a fourth degree polynomial to model a phenomenon in our observable world. In this case, what we're gonna do is type in smarter every day potato gun. Look at that, it's already filled out for me. And then we're gonna go over to videos and then see the watermelon destroyed by potato gun. We're gonna click on that. This is gonna be the source of um, some inspiration for a modeling problem. Um, you can watch that video on your own time. I'm not gonna repeat it for you. What I'm gonna do is skip ahead to the mathematical modeling part of this video. Um, and it looks like right around, uh, yeah, there it is, four minutes and 29 seconds. The pressure can dip so low. Yeah, so he goes into a whole discussion about how this works. The um, This is a, a model of the potato barrel position versus the pressure inside that little gun. So if you go back and look at the gun that he constructed, it's kind of like a PVC pipe gun. And he stuffs a potato in there, and then he, well, beforehand, he actually um, constructed it in such a way that the air is kind of trapped, sticks a potato in, put some uh, burnable fuel, lights the fuel, and the potato gets shot out. And it just so happens that as I was watching this video, I noticed that the behavior of this graph actually looks like a quartic polynomial, a fourth degree polynomial. And for many years of my life, I used to think like, it is not hard for me to think how, to, how lines get modeled for real world purposes. It's not hard for me to think how quadratics, like just drop anything, the parabolic arch, of anything that drops with gravity. There's a gravity um, uh, model. Uh, cubic polynomials are actually really useful for the motion of smooth curves. Later in this class, we'll talk about uh, cubic splines. So that's not that bad, but quartic is not something that really comes up easily. Now, I would say that if you're thinking about roller coaster design and getting stuff really, really um, smooth from the standpoint of feeling joints in the roller coaster while you're riding, I can definitely imagine some work to be done there. But um, for the most part, case, asking ourselves like where do fourth degree polynomials show up? That's been something that's been on my mind for days. And when I watched this video, I thought to myself, hey, this model right here that he's talking about, that graph actually looks like a fourth degree polynomial. I wonder if I could kind of set something up. And at the bottom of this video, you can kind of zoom in right under the play bar, he actually gives uh, access to a study on this and the study is actually written by Courtney and Courtney it's called studying the internal ballistic of a combustion cannon so if you type that into any Google search or in my case DuckDuckGo um, at the top of this you see studying the internal ballistics there's a PDF so I actually clicked on that downloaded it here it is as a PDF form and then I spent I don't know probably three or four hours reading it trying to get a sense of what was going on the end result though is that this graph is kind of the optimal graph that I care about in this case so we have the pressure in a potato gun based on the different type of gas that I push in there. Please do watch that other video to get a sense of what the heck's going on here. Um, but what I did is I actually thought to myself like, okay, well, what if I were to capture some of the data from this actual graph and then try to create a fourth degree polynomial model that kind of measures that as such. And so I actually recreated, I took this thing, put it into Mathematica in this case and recreated it. I will say that the three data points that you see here, I use the very technical and scientific method called spitballing. So literally what I did is I just looked at this graph. I kind of looked at the zero mark, the 0.5 and the one, and then just spitballed. I'll have a little bit to say to that in a bit. That's not super scientific, but it's a good representation in the sense that when I'm building models, each data point represents a single equation in my larger model. And in this case, because I'm trying to do general linear systems with a rectangular short wide matrix, I, I don't actually have tons of data points. In the um, actual experiment, the best thing to do would be to get the raw data, but I didn't wanna write a bunch of emails in order to do that. Um, but I hope you're seeing that like building models is hard. So anyways, the point of the matter is that from that graph, we get these data points. And this is where our mathematical model begins. We've kind of seen this before. We have already chosen a style that we're going to use to describe the data that we're seeing. In this case, it's gonna be a fourth degree polynomial. 
So general form of a fourth degree polynomial is P of X is A naught plus A1 times X plus A2 times X squared plus A3 times X cubed plus A4 times X to the fourth. Those coefficients, the A sub I coefficients are the unknown and desired in this problem. We're gonna try to use the data that we've collected, so to speak, which took about four hours. That's quite sh a short amount of time from the standpoint of scientific investigation. We're gonna to try to use that to create a general in your systems problem. So let's switch over to the actual mathematical analysis. Before I begin constructing my linear systems, one thing that I'm gonna do is spend a little bit of time thinking about the behavior of my polynomial model. So we said that this was a fourth degree polynomial. Each of these things is a scalar multiplication. I know immediately that scalar multiplication is commutative. In other words, I can bring the variable out in front by just switching the operation. There's always a one in front. I can multiply by one with no cost. So that's where that comes from. Claim, this is a very, very famous form called ascending powers. And I can actually write those powers explicitly. One is x to the zero, x is x to the one, x2, x3, x4. This is gonna be our polynomial basis that we're gonna expand the route. We'll get more about that when we get into um, infinite dimensional ve vector spaces or polynomial vector spaces. But the point of the matter is, I can think about each evaluation of our polynomial function for a particular value of x as a single inner product where I evaluate x at each input and then I multiply by the scaling coefficients and this will give me my given output. So when I look back at my data, each input I can actually evaluate as a single row vector. The output to those will be given on the right-hand side from my collected scientific data. And then given that I have a set of input and a set of output, my goal for this modeling operation is to find the possible values of my scaling coefficients to determine what this polynomial could be that models the behavior of pressure versus position in a potato gun. In order to create a general linear systems problem where I have given matrix A, given vector B, unknown vector X, where the matrix A is an M by N, the matrix B is an M by one, and then my unknown N by one vector X. In this case, I'm gonna want M equations in N unknowns. Each equation, when we're thinking about discretizing scientific data, comes from a unique data point. In this situation, we have one, two, three data points, so we expect the number of rows on this matrix to be three. We also know that our given function has one, two, three, four, five unknown coefficients, so we expect the number of unknowns to be five. In other words, given the situation that we've just constructed, we're gonna have a short, wide matrix because there are less equations than unknowns. With that in mind, let's take a look at the first equation that arises, which is from the first data point. What we do is we say, okay, hey, we want to construct a function that describes this particular phenomenon. We know the observed input is gonna be a measurement of zero meters where the potato is along the gun, and the observed output is gonna be zero kilopascal of pressures inside the actual barrel, and that came from the observations that we were making. Once we know that, we can take that given input Substitute it for the x values in my model. So everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna put zero. So zero to the zero is one, zero to the one is zero, 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 zero. That's exactly what we see here. We set the right-hand side to zero. We get a single inner product, which corresponds to evaluating that function at that point. And that now becomes one row of our matrix later on. Let's construct our second equation. In order to do our second equation, we're gonna work down the list. We've already got the first one. The next one, we're gonna say, hey, the input value for our second data point is 0 0.5. The output value is 51. These would usually come from precise scientific measurements using well-calibrated instruments. In this case, they're called my eyes. Once we have that information, we can then go ahead and put one half in for x. Everywhere we see x, we put in a one half. One half to the zero is one. One half to the one is one half. One half to the two is one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth. And that leads to an equation where the input values, the coefficients of that row of my matrix are given by actually evaluating each of those x values. And then my unknown coefficients are desired. My right-hand side is 51 kilopascal coming from 
the graph that I started with or scientific data that I collected. The third equation that we have comes from the third data point. We know that the input to that is 1.0, so one meter down the barrel of a potato gun. The output is 30 kilopascal, the amount of pressure held up in that. And then we can jump immediately to the end. Hopefully by this point you kind of get the idea. I have a row of all ones, I have my unknown coefficients, and I have my right hand side 30. With our powers combined, we can use those three equations to state a general linear systems problem. And that general linear systems problem, each of these things has to do with a single data point. The inputs here are literally evaluating the base functions, the, the, in this case, x to the zero, x to the one, x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, at the individual x's that I collected in my data. The right-hand sides are the corresponding output values. And then these coefficients determine the amount of scalars of each of those x functions that I needed in order to determine that. Now, when we take a look at this general linear systems problems, there are less equations than unknowns. We call that underdetermined. There are not enough equations to determine these scalars specifically. Another way to say that is, we don't have a unique function to describe that blue behavior of the amount of pressure as the potato runs down the barrel of that gun. In fact, in the way that we set up this problem, there are an infinite number of fourth degree polynomials that run through only those three data points. I agree that the one that you see there should be unique, but we don't have enough data to be able to determine what the parameters are of, of that unique function is just from the way that we describe this. In general, this will be a feature of general linear systems problems versus non-singular linear systems problems versus least squares problems. When I collect less data than there are unknowns, I'm making the claim that I can make inferences about global macro trends from a very, very small amount of data. There's kind of a funny example of this process that happened in the United States Congress. If you search snowball as evidence that climate change isn't real, the first article that you get there is of a congressperson that was making the argument that climate change can't be real because he found snow on the ground outside of the Capitol building. I'm not gonna make any comments about the politics of that particular argument, why he did that, whether or not he understood what he was saying, but what I will say is that gentleman was looking at a system when they're, that, that have probably thousands, tens of thousands, or maybe millions of unknowns. The climate of the world depends on a ton of variables, and he had one data point. So he was trying to make an observation about global trends using only one data point. Well, from a mathematical standpoint, we would say that is an ill-defined problem. One data point is not enough to be able to accurately describe present and past observations in such a way that we would have some confidence of those observations for future predictions. That phenomenon very much shows up in general linear systems problems. The more data that we take, the more information that we're collecting. But what ends up happening is when we have more equations than unknowns, we have a tall, thin matrix. And generally, those matrices will yield equations that are actually unsolvable. And when we get into that paradigm, that's called least squares. The non-singular linear case, systems case, where we have the exact same number of equations as we do unknown variables, is kind of ideal in the sense that we have a unique solution, a unique pattern that exactly determines the behavior of the underlying phenomenon. The sad part though is that because measurements usually include errors, statisticians and scientists will very, very seldom yield linear systems problems from a straight set of data. We'll talk more about that in the future, but that is the process by which we are given a matrix. It's actually quite expensive and takes a lot of time. In the last videos in this lesson, we'll play with some toy examples of general linear systems problems to get more into the specifics of how the mathematical calculations work. I'll see you in the next video.